Our scripture reading this morning is coming from John chapter 21. He's reading verses 1 through 14. John 21, 1 through 14. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And he manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. So he said to him, hey, we'll come also with you. They went out and got into the boat and that night they caught nothing. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, children, you don't have any fish, do you? They said, no. So he said to them, try casting the net on the right side of the boat and you will find a catch. So they cast and they were not able to haul, in, haul it in because of the great number of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard this, heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not, not far from the land, but about a hundred and about a hundred yards away, dragging the net full of fish. So when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid, and fish placed on it and bread. Jesus said to them, "Bring some of the fish which you have caught." Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, full of fish, a hundred and fifty-three. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, "Come and have breakfast." None of the disciples ventured to question him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and like the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. The account that Chris just read for us is the fulfillment of prophecy. You may not have caught that. You may not have recognized that in and of itself. But I take you to previous texts, but I take you to previous studies and other gospel accounts that give us this insight. If we take a look in the gospel account of Mark, chapter 14 and verse 28, this is just before Jesus would be crucified on the cross. He would say to his disciples, before, but after I have been raised... I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Well, then Mark would record in just a couple of chapters later in Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 7, we would read the account of the empty tomb. And we would read, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might come and anoint him. Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. They were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone from, for us from the entrance of the tomb? Looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. Verses 5 through 7 continue. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee, and there you will see him just as he told you. Jesus foretold his resurrection. That came to be true. He foretold that he would meet his disciples in Galilee. And with the text that we will be entering into this morning, we will see the fulfillment of that prophecy. We are entering into the last chapter of the Gospel of John. We are now in the 21st and final chapter of this study that we've been in for quite a while at this point in time. And this morning what we're going to do is we are not going to really be dealing with a part one, part two lesson. Part one this week, part two next week. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at this morning's lesson, which is certainly connected to next week's lesson. It occurs at the same time, at the same place, in the same setting. But we're going to take a look at the first 14 verses of John chapter 21. And we are going to take a look both literally... And then we're going to take a look at, figuratively, why we need to cast our nets 
on the right side. So this morning, that's what we're going to be taking a look at. Cast your net on the right side. Let's jump into our, our lesson and let's first and foremost take a look at a map and help us that will help us to understand certain principles that we would be uh, good to know going into this lesson. If we take a look at a map of Palestine, like the one that's before you and like ones that are probably in most of your Bibles in the back, in the map section, you'll find that there are four notable bodies of water in Israel. First and foremost, that largest body of water off the west coast of Palestine, that's the Mediterranean Sea. And then you see three other bodies of water, but they're much smaller. Uh, first of all, in the top right-hand portion of your screen, you're going to see a little round body of water. That's the Sea of Galilee. And then you're going to see a river flowing south out of the Sea of Galilee. Going straight south, that river is the Jordan River, where Jesus was baptized, where uh, Joshua led the Israelites through into the Promised Land. And that was another time where God parted the water for them and they walked across on dry land. And the Jordan River then turns around and flows into that larger body of water in the southeastern part of our map, the bottom right-hand part of our map. And that, of course, is the Dead Sea. Now, if we go back up to that top part, I want us to consider this for just a second. I got it. Thank you. The Sea of Galilee, which is that little body to the top right of our previous map, the Sea of Galilee was also known as the Sea of Tiberias. And in most of our translations in John chapter 21 and verse 1, we see a reference to the Sea or the Lake of Tiberias, also known as Gennesaret, had several names. But we, of course, understand that probably more often than not because of other gospel writers to be the Sea of Galilee. This is where Jesus revealed himself to his disciples for the third time. And we see that not only does he reveal himself as verse 1 will introduce this story by telling us that, but verse 14 tells us that this was in fact the third time from the moment that he rose from the dead, that he appeared to and spoke to his disciples. Now, let's jump into some things that are detail-oriented but helpful to us to know what's going on. First and foremost, John records eight people present in the first 14 verses. First and foremost, we see Jesus. Uh, Jesus, the risen Savior, out of the tomb, back from the dead, he is there meeting up with seven other people. The first one that we know is Simon Peter. Uh, Simon Peter we know uh, as a faithful servant of Jesus, one of the first appointed to be one of his disciples, ultimately one of his apostles. We also see Peter with his great faith slipping from time to time, when he denied Jesus three times, when he gives in later in the book of Galatians to prejudice and racism. We also see Thomas, and we talked a lot about Thomas just last week, also called Didymus. This was the apostle who said, I will not believe that Jesus is risen until I can touch the nail prints in his hands till I can put my hand in his side where the sword pierced him. Uh, he will go down as doubting Thomas. But as we pointed out in last week's lesson, Thomas was not the only one who doubted. The other disciples doubted. Mary Magdalene doubted. But Thomas seemed to desire and require the most proof. Then we jump into Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee. And I want you to consider who is this Nathaniel that we don't seem to read a lot about. And I told the young people in my teenage class this morning, I said, be mindful of this part of the lesson because you might learn something. Because other gospel writers seem to suggest this person by another name. But let's start off with what John calls him and how John refers to him in John chapter 1. And verses 43 through 49. John chapter 1, verses 43 through 49. 
We read in this passage of Scripture that the next day he purposed to go into Galilee. And he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Here's another person who has his doubts until it is proven who it is who is standing before him back from the dead, risen from the tomb. And that's Nathanael. In fact, Nathanael will probably go down in history as being the person who would ask that famous question, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? That was Nathaniel. But here's what's interesting. If you'll note the question that I have on the PowerPoint behind me, is this Bartholomew? Most theologians believe that it is. And the reason is because we have disciples who are also being understood as apostles in the presence of Jesus. And although we know several of them by name, including Nathaniel, Nathaniel we understand as Thomas is called Didymus, as Simon is called Peter, also Cephas, sometimes they had various designations. And if we consider for just a moment that Bartholomew is the name of the apostle that's given to us in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in their listing, and I have all of those on the board for you, in the listing of the twelve apostles, Philip is followed by Bartholomew in each of those. And it is believed by some because of certain evidence like that, that this is perhaps the Bartholomew that Matthew, Mark, and Luke refer to, but that John calls Nathaniel. If in fact this is the case, we have simply yet another apostle, and it would make sense that he would be there. We'll get to that in just a minute. I want you to consider numbers 5 and 6 on our list. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, also known as the sons of thunder. These apostles are present in this particular scene. Uh, John, often referred to as the apostle whom Jesus loved or the disciple whom Jesus loved. And then numbers, numbers 7 and 8, two other apostles. Now who are they? Well. Very simply, we don't know. The Bible does not give us this information in this particular record of the Gospel of John. But if I had to guess, I think that there might be some fairly good information that is at our disposal to come at a pretty decent idea. First and foremost, if in fact Nathaniel is Bartholomew, then we might see that this one of these disciples would be Philip, who was obviously close with Bartholomew. Philip is the one who introduced Jesus to Bartholomew in our reading just a moment ago. And we also know that Philip was from the same town as Peter and Andrew, two of our fishermen in this morning's story. Who would the other one be? Well, perhaps the other disciple is Andrew himself. Peter and Andrew went together. James and John went together. Philip and Bartholomew went together. And of course, we have Thomas. So we might, we definitely know five, and we might know seven of the people who are present at this moment in time. People who are outside of Thomas, who are relating, related to the fishing industry, or live in a fishing town around the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias. Let me ask you this question. In verse 3, who decided to go fishing? I was reading that uh, passage of Scripture earlier in such a way as to be, distinguish itself from Chris. Uh, I was reading verse 3, Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. Uh, Chris's reading was a little more relaxed. It, to, it told me that Peter was a guy that I might like a little bit more. He seemed to be a good guy. He said, I'm going fishing. 
And the other guys go, we're going to go too. And so who decided to go fishing? According to verse 3, let me be real clear so that I can make this point and set the precedence for the rest. Several professional fishermen. I don't know that it would be obvious that Matthew, the tax collector, was one of the men present. But for the reasons given and for the information that is revealed to us in the scripture, it's very clear that we have at least three fishermen present. James, John, and Peter. And if we have Andrew, and if we have Bartholomew, uh, if these are the case, if we have Philip, who is also from that area, we've got a large number of people who do this for a living. If you take a look at Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22, we run across that very first account where Jesus called his disciples. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18, we read that Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Verse 21 reads, going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. You see, we've got some people who know what it's like to go fishing. Now, I'm not one of those people. I realize where I live in central Florida, we've got a lot of lakes. I realize we're coming into that year where a lot of winter people come down, and I realize that we're at the part of the year where those people join the locals, and they go out to the lakes, and they go fishing. Uh, they, they go fishing with fancy rods and reels. They go fishing with uh, sonar and GPS devices, and they know what it's like to put the hook in the water and uh, know when something's nibbling on it and know when they're supposed to jerk that line and when they're not supposed to jerk that line. I am the opposite of all of these things. Number one, if you don't give me one of those little floats on my line, I'm at a loss because the only thing I know is when the float goes underwater, you're supposed to lift up your cane pole and you should have a fish on the other end. That's about my extent. But I had an elder in the church tell me once upon a time when I was a kid, uh, he and my dad used to go fishing at the Tennessee Valley Authority down at Pickwick by the big dam there. And, and I, on the other hand, would lose patience within 30 minutes. I just couldn't stand any more of that. And then I would go ask Dad, do you want me to go to the vending machine and get you a drink? I'd ask Brother Johnson, do you want me to go to the vending machine and get you a snack? Hey, Dad, can I have the keys to the car and drive around in the park? Anything but to do what they were doing. And they were sitting on a rock waiting to catch a fish. That elder looked at me one time and he said, Kevin, you're the only fisherman I know who can go fishing and not get his hook wet. I look back there and I see those Grigsby's. I see all those pictures of fish, uh, fish that they catch. They're not catching my kind of fish. They're catching these kind of fish. Y'all need to take me out and show me how it's done. But I literally one time caught the longest fish, I, biggest fish I'd ever caught. It was 12 inches long. It was a catfish. The reason I know this is because on the day after I'd gone fishing with my dad and this gentleman in a pond, the gentleman called the next day to inform me that I had left my pole in the water and by the morning I'd caught a fish. That's how I do it. I don't know any better. Don't know any more than that. But these guys did. These guys understood what they were doing. They did it for a living. They did it out on a boat. They did it in a sea, which to us on a map looks like a big giant pond. But no, it would be more like Okeechobee, where it can get very dangerous in the middle of that, where you can get to places where you can't see the shoreline. You're so far out in the middle of it. And little storms can come up. And because of how the lake is, is built, because of how it's made, uh, the, the winds and the waves can be dangerous and life-threatening. And we see instances of that throughout the scriptures. But these men knew what to do. These men knew how to do it. They were professionals. This is how they earned their living, made their livelihood. And they caught nothing all night long. The guys who knew how to do it caught nothing all night long. 
what happens at daybreak. Verses 4, 5, and the first part of 6 reveal that at daybreak, a carpenter showed up to tell the fishermen how to fish. I want you to think about for that for a second. At this point in the text, it is actually revealed to us that nobody knows that this is Jesus yet. He is a long way away from the shore. He, it may have been too far for them to recognize who it was. This is at daybreak, so although the, the sun is rising, it still may be partially dark with mountains around Galilee. It, he could have been in the shadow of a mountain. The bottom line is they didn't know who he was. But I want to make this point. And it's a point that the text does not reveal, but it's always something that's come up in my mind. A carpenter shows up to tell professional fishermen how to fish. I want you to consider what he said. He did not say, change the bait. I remember going fishing one of those times when I was a kid and I was fishing with worms, which I had somebody else put on the hook for me. And my dad and this other gentleman, they're fishing with bread. Don't know why, but they didn't catch anything. And I did catch these little guys. And it was the one time in my life where I seemed to really enjoy fishing because about every five or ten minutes I'd catch something. So that was, it's always fun when you're catching stuff. These guys go all night long and they catch nothing and Jesus shows up and says, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find a catch. Now, if their boat were in a fish hatchery, that would make sense to me. Don't put it in this pool of water because there are no fish here. Put it in this pool of water here because there's a whole bunch of fish here. This is the Sea of Galilee. And again, there may be all kinds of things that professional fishermen know that I don't know. But it seems like the fish can swim from the left side of the boat to the right side of the boat and vice versa. And to someone like me who doesn't know any better, that seems to almost be a silly thing to say unless you're the son of God. And unless you have devised a plan to make it abundantly clear that you are, in fact, deity in the flesh. Jesus gives the command, cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. And then in the latter part of verse 6, going all the way down to verse 13, something truly amazing occurs. Those fishermen caught the catch of a lifetime. The text reveals to us that they brought up 153 fish in that one instance. They went from catching nothing to having their nets completely full. And unlike another occasion, whereas the text reveals to us their nets were not breaking, they were full. They were to capacity. 153 fish all because they lowered their nets on the right-hand side of the boat rather than the left. Again, that's not a fishing tactic. Uh, that's not something that Jesus knew about how to catch these things that these professional fishermen didn't know. This was simply a demonstration of God's power, and it was a demonstration indeed. At this moment in time, John recognizes Jesus tells Peter it's Jesus, Peter throws on his outer garment and jumps out of the boat again. What is up with Peter always jumping out of really good boats? That's what he does. When Jesus comes walking to him on a storm, he gets out of the boat and he walks to Jesus on the water as Jesus was walking to him. And in this case, he is so excited to see his Lord and his master, that he quite literally, at least a, a hundred yards out from the shoreline, he jumps out of the boat and swims. He doesn't want to wait till the boat gets to shore. He doesn't want to wait until the others help him get. He's so excited, he jumps out of the boat and swims to Jesus. And later in the story, Jesus would feed his disciples with the very food 
He provided them. I want to ask you this question. Because although our story this morning is very simple and straightforward, there's really not a lot to it that's hard to understand, I want to ask you this question. Are we ever professional fishermen? I'm not talking about going out on a boat. I'm not talking about dropping a hook in the water with bait attached. I want to ask you something that is not indicated in the story. There is nothing in our text that suggests that the disciples did not follow Jesus' commands because they were professional fishermen and he was a carpenter. There's nothing in here that suggests that the man giving them advice was not heeded by the apostles. In fact, the story very simply says, even though they didn't know who it was, that was in the boat, or who it was that was on the shore, the disciples still followed his directions, cast their net on the right side, and pulled up all the fish. But Kevin Patterson looks at this a little bit differently. Because Kevin Patterson looks at this account in Scripture with 2020 hindsight. I know who it was on the shore. And although I know who he is spiritually, I also know who he is physically. He's a carpenter. He's the son of a carpenter. And when I ask the question, are we ever professional fishermen? I wonder sometimes if we ever ask the question or if we ever think that we know more about our lives and how to run them than anyone else. I'm almost surprised at the reaction of the disciples. It, in fact, kind of amazes me that these professional fishermen did not look at the guy on the shore and say, what do you know about anything? Do you do this for a living? Why are you giving us advice? If they in fact had known he was not Jesus but a carpenter, how many would have said, after all, you're a carpenter. Why don't you go make something with wood and let us go catch the fish? That's what I mean when I say, are we ever professional fishermen? Do we ever think that we know more about our lives and how to run them than anyone else? And by the way, that includes Jesus. How many of us think that maybe because we have been successful in this life financially that we don't really need God's help? How many of us who have been fairly well off physically and with our health think that we don't need God in our lives? How many of us have been blessed in so many ways with various talents and abilities and we've had that all our lives and so therefore we kind of learn how to rely on ourselves rather than others and most importantly God? How many of us have the attitude that other people are not worthy to give us advice? I sat back there in preparation for this lesson, and I thought about Don Ware. He's a medical doctor. You have any idea how many non-medical personnel with nothing more than Google at their disposal have been giving him advice for the last year and a half on the pandemic? And I wonder, does Don ever sit there and think, wait, I'm the doctor, not you. I said, about, think about Olin. And I think about legal matters. Here's a fellow who went to law school, who has been a, a judge uh, sitting on the bench for years now. And I wonder how many times people give him legal advice or give other people legal advice, A, when they're not legally able to, and B, when they're just flat out wrong. And I wonder if Olin ever thinks, hey, wait, I'm the attorney here, not you. Oh, and then there's the preachers. You know, the preachers who are full-time preachers, who preach and teach every week, multiple times a week, who study the Bible, uh, who prepare lessons, they even prepare PowerPoints so that people can see, and, and they get out, and then somebody comes along and questions what they've said. I wonder how many of us 
have the attitude, what do you know? I wonder how many times we act like professional fishermen and think that we are the end-all, be-all of knowledge and understanding. If so, how's that working for you? How is your knowledge without God going to help you eternally? How is your health after death going to help you? How is your experience and your work history going to help you when this life is over? Oh, and by the way, how much more it could be helped in this life if we would rely on our Lord like seemingly these professional fishermen did. They didn't know who he was. They couldn't make him out on the shoreline. And yet they did what he said. And they were blessed as a result. I would ask you to consider that. I would ask you to consider that we not be, not something that's revealed in the story, but just something that I glean from the story, that we not be so full of ourselves that we cannot accept the help of others that we might need, that we cannot help accept the help from God that we require. Sometimes that just means we need to humble ourselves. We need to think about him more and how much we rely on him more. And how the things that we have been given in this life, whether it be money or health or work or family or friends, that these things come from him, that he provided it. What we have to do is we have to make sure that we follow the principles of this story and put them into practice. So if you haven't been, I want to ask you to consider that today is the perfect time for you, number one, to start listening to a carpenter about how to catch fish. Stop thinking that you know all there is to know about everything in life, and that most, insert, that most certainly includes how to live in this life and receive life in the life to come. Those answers come from God. Those answers come from His Holy Word. They come from no one else. They don't come from any false modern-day prophets. They don't come from any false modern-day statements of faith. They don't come from any false modern-day preachers. They come from the Bible. Those instructions are there. And if we will study to show ourselves approved unto God, then we would have a great blessing indeed because we would learn to listen to someone who may be a carpenter but who in fact is the creator of all, the maker of all, and he who knows all. Number two, today's the perfect time for you to start casting your net on the right side. And this is the figurative part of my lesson because interestingly enough, the fishermen in our story cast their net on the right side as opposed to the left side. What I'm asking you to do is cast your net on the right side as opposed to the wrong side. Now, once again, there may be a lot of reasons why you don't catch fish in a lake with live bait on a rod and reel. I'm going to let people who are far more knowledgeable in those areas answer those questions. But I'm going to say this. When it comes to the spiritual world, when it comes to living this life in a way that is free from peace and filled with joy. You have to know how to fish, and you have to fish in the right place. Let me give you an example for a second. It's interesting to me when people talk about, well, I'm not getting anywhere in life. Well, what are you doing in life? Well, what do you mean? What am I doing? They act as if somebody else has to do it for them. God wants us to be hard workers. God wants us to put in our part. I think about families sometimes, and they, they'll come to me and say, well, my family's fallen apart. What can I do? And the first thing that I want to say is, well, are you living, are you raising that family in the ways that are right? Why haven't I seen you in worship? Why haven't I seen you in Bible study? Why are other things more important than God? That's a prescription for disaster. When you think about friends, and somebody says, well, I've al always got the wrong kind of friends. I'm always uh, having problems with them. Well, where are you looking for friends? 
Are you looking for friends in bars? Are you looking for friends in dance halls? Are you looking for friends in the local atheist society? Because trust me, those are the wrong places. Look for friends in the household of God. And I'm not talking about a physical structure. I'm talking about the body of Christ. Look for a mate in the body of Christ. So very happy for Troy and Jessica yesterday. Married. In the eyes of God, seen as one. Who are they? <laughs> They're husband and wife. But before they were husband and wife, they were brother and sister in Christ. They have the same faith. They have the same God. They have the same focus. And they're headed into the same future together. That's a way to start a home. That's a way to raise a family. But I see people all the time talking to me about how their life seems to be wrong. They keep casting their net. They keep living their life. But they're doing it in the wrong way, in the wrong places, with the wrong people. This is a great story for us to learn. Cast your net on the right side. Cast your net on the righteous side. Cast your net on the godly side. Make the decisions in life, whether it be your friends, your family, your finances, whether it be the places you frequent or the things that consume your life. Make sure you do those things that please God. Make sure that you are striving to keep Him happy. Make sure you are serving others and putting their well-being above the selfishness of your own. And I promise you, according to the Bible, this life will be amazing. It will be amazing indeed. Oh, it'll be fraught with problems, persecution, temptations, struggles. Tri it will be the best life you'll ever live. And sometimes I want to just say to people and their problems, cast your net on the right side. Try that. Try Jesus' way for a little bit. Try doing it God's way for a while. See if there's a big difference. Because even if you enjoy the peace that passes all understanding and the joy that has no end, it still doesn't mean that this life's going to be easy. Maybe in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, maybe we're like Lazarus. Maybe our health is terrible. Uh, maybe we don't have two nickels to rub together in this life. Uh, maybe this has been a tough existence indeed. But when Lazarus died, the Bible describes he was carried away into paradise on the wings of, on the wings of angels. When I think about that, I think about his glory really just began. And everything that we deal with in li this life, good and bad, when we make the right decisions and when we cast our nets, not on the wrong side, but the right side, then we get to look forward to that life eternal where we won't deal with any suffering or problems or temptations or trials. Number three, if you haven't been, today's the perfect time for you to start letting Jesus feed you with the spiritual food he provides. You know what, when I, let me just say, whenever I want food, I live in a time and a place, in a country, where I can pretty much have it. Food's at our disposal. We have plenty in our refrigerators, plenty in our freezers. We got restaurants galore, and we live in a financially wealthy time and country. When I want something to eat, I can usually eat it. We're not talking about physical food any more than we're talking about physical fishing at this point in time. I'm talking about spiritual food. I'm talking about the Word of God. And here's what's interesting. Whereas I love my physical food and I love to eat, do I love the Word of God? Do I want the Word of God. That right there is one of the problems. People talk about, I love God, but they do nothing to show it. People say, oh, I believe that the Bible is God, God's Word, and they never read it. Cast your net on the right side. Read the Word of God. Learn the Word of God. Love the Word of God so that you will desire spiritual food like you desire physical food. 
and where you desire it to such a point that you can't get enough of it, that you long for it, you crave it. When we went through the height of the pandemic, I remember members of this body who were unable to meet with us, who would talk to me and share with me in tears how much they hated being separated from the body. They hated being able to not be in the presence of people who are worshiping God and opening up the Bible together and studying it as one. Some of you who are able to be here don't know and don't get some of the feedback that I get from some of our live stream friends. But almost on a weekly basis, I have people who are saying, would you please turn the cameras around so that I can see all of the people here. I hear them before the lesson. I hear them laughing. I hear them talking. I hear them sharing. And I miss that so much. Could you please turn the camera around? so that I can see them. If you want to truly be spiritually fed, you have to want to be fed. Because whereas in this life, my stomach will tell me when I'm hungry, even when my head's not thinking about it, my head has to do all the thinking and the wanting when it comes to the Word of God. Think about it. When we get through with this hour of worship, we're going to have another 30 minutes or so where some of our young men are going to lead us in worship to God. They're going to open up the Bible and they're going to read from its pages. They're going to lead us in songs. Let me ask you this question. Do you want to be here for that? Wednesday night we'll have a Bible study. Do you want to be here for that? Tomorrow, we're going to go support another congregation in the area who's having a gospel meeting. Maybe not everybody can come because it's a work day and we may be leaving before some of you uh, are able to make it. But if you could, would you want to be there? Tuesday morning, ladies' Bible class. Again, during a work day for some of, uh, some of our number who can't. But if you could, do you want to be there? Do you look forward to Sundays and Wednesdays and other times when you have to meet with one another? Let me ask you this. Do you look forward to reading your Bible every single day? There's probably not a one of us in here who will not eat something physically today. And hopefully we've been fed spiritually today. But what about tomorrow? Breakfast, lunch, supper, I bet you'll eat it. But will you open up the Bible? Will you read from its pages? Will you feast from what it spiritually has to feed you? You got to cast your net on the right side. And making that decision to do so might be hard. Maybe we are still a little full of ourselves. Maybe we are still the ones who are saying, well, everything's going fine now. When I'm older, I'll get more serious about my salvation. When I'm older, like Kevin's dad, and I'm 87 years old, well, then I'll get serious because that's when you die. Well, what about Kevin's brother-in-law who suddenly died at age 58? What about that fellow we read about in our announcements today who's 29 years old and his lungs have collapsed and he may have to have a full lung transplant in order to live? What about that? I look back in the congregation right now and I see a little boy who just after he was born had to go through surgery for his heart. We don't have guarantees of life. We don't have guarantees of tomorrow. We don't have guarantees of today. What we have a guarantee of is right now and the opportunity to cast our net on the right side. And that's the side of Jesus Christ. It's interesting that back in the very beginning, when Jesus met Peter, Andrew, James, and John, those fishermen, he talked to them about fishing then too. But interestingly enough, what he said to them was, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. 
And immediately they left their nets and followed him. They left their livelihood. They left their work for that moment in time. And they followed Jesus. Why? Because being spiritually fed is more important than being physically fed. And being spiritually right is way more important than what this world sometimes thinks is right by position or place or how much we've got in our pockets. Being right with God, doing the right thing, casting our nets in the spiritual right place is truly all that matters in this life. Because everything that we know of in this world will one day be destroyed except for our eternal spirits which will return to God for a judgment that will last forever. So here's my question. Where are you casting your nets today? Are you casting it in the wrong place or are you casting it in the right place? If you're not a member of the body of Christ, brethren, let me say to you and to those who are not members, who are not yet a part of that family, let me say that you have got to make that right decision. Stop casting your net on the wrong side of the boat. Cast it where you can catch something and be nourished by it. If you have not put on Jesus Christ in baptism, there's no better time than you, for you to put your faith into practice. Repent of sins, confess the name of Jesus, and be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then and only then can you come in contact with the blood of Christ. Then and only then can your sins be washed away. Uh, folks, it's a simple decision, but it's the only right one that leads to the forgiveness of sins in this life and life eternal in the heaven of God. If you are a child of God, when you made a decision once upon a time to cast your net on the right side, have you strayed away? Have you started having professional fisherman syndrome? And you've started to say, well, hey, I, I, I'm in the body of Christ. I'm a member of the family of God. I'm a child of the Father, so I'm going to kind of start doing things my way, and I'm going to go back to the ways that I used to do things and things like that. Is that the mentality that we have? Please stop right there because your net's in the wrong place. Cast your net on the right side. Put your net in the right place. Do what is right according to God and enjoy the blessings of this world and the blessing of life eternal in the world to come. Think about it. This isn't a fishing lesson from a physical standpoint, but it is a fishing lesson from a spiritual standpoint. And if we want to allow Jesus to make us into fishers of men, then we've got to make sure that we've cast our nets in the right place. Won't you do that all together? We stand and sing.